Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pamela Hastings, and welcome to another Barometer Wednesday afternoon webcast. It is November 11th, and it has been quite the start to a week. Joining me today is David Burroughs, Chief Investment Strategist and President at Barometer Capital Management. Today, we will provide you with a brief mar market update and overview, and we will be happy to address all of your questions, especially coming off of the US election and the spike in the, the stock market on Monday. Uh, if you have questions, you can send them via the chat or you can email me at phastings at barometercapital.ca. And with that, I turn the conversation over to David Burroughs. Good afternoon, David. Good afternoon, Pam. Thanks so much for, uh, for kicking off the call this afternoon and thanks everybody for tuning in. Wow, 2020 is going to be one for the books. Uh, certainly there's been lots of things to think about as investors, lots of big sort of binary issues. And in fact, I guess if it comes down to it, we've really been through four years of binary issues. You know, I, I sometimes long for the days where things happened incrementally uh, but we've lived in a time with an administration who have uh, surprised investors on many occasions. And, and frankly, as I said on the last call, I think a lot of people suffer from PTSD, wondering what the heck is going to happen next. Uh, and all we can really do as, as investors is take new information as it comes, uh, run it through a filter that you look at in a consistent way, uh, and adjust as you go along. And, uh, and certainly, you know, that has been a requirement over the last few years. Um, taking the lens way back, as you know, we believe we're in a structural bull market that started in 2013, when we exceeded the highs from 2000. <clears throat> and since then, despite some, you know, significant fits and starts, uh, market has been more like three steps forward and one step back, as opposed to sort of one step forward and one step back in the structural bear markets that we've seen in the past. Um, we talked the last time about the fact that you know, in the third quarter, we had a quite a strong quarter coming into fall. And that while we always have some bumpiness in the fall, historically, when you had a very strong third quarter, it typically pointed to a strong fourth quarter. And this takes that data back to the 1950s, looking for quarters where the market was up over seven and a half percent in the third quarter. And part of the reason for that is that when you get to the fourth quarter, often analysts have recognized that their expectations were too high. They had to take down their earnings estimates and growth estimates, and often you would get some sloppiness late in the year. Uh, we know that we've come through the third quarter, and here we are now, November the 11th. And so the first thing that I'll say is that seasonally we know that if you put money in the market on October the 31st, every year for the last 50 years and took it out on April 30th, you captured more than 100% of the gain, the annual gains in the market over that period of time. So it tends to be that April through end of September, uh, sorry, end of October is, is a more difficult six months. So seasonally we're into the stronger period of the year. And uh, as we said in the last call, we thought that as we moved through the course of the past week, so many of the uncertainties that we worry about might become a little bit clearer. We were sort of at maximum uncertainty. We expected, you know, a bumpy week. This is what I put up on the screen last week um, that there was, uh, uh, or two weeks ago, that we had an election in front of us. Uh, we had uh, concerns around COVID. We had earnings coming out uh, that were uh, gonna be telling. And that investors were very, very cautious. We know that flows had been out of the market as people became sellers just to be on the sidelines leading into the election. And certainly we had a little bit of cash, but my view was that we would see some reduction in uncertainty. Our, our breadth indicators, which are our guide, uh, had been cautious over the previous few weeks, meaning the percent of stocks in upward price trends had deteriorated somewhat. But that despite that, we had started to see our short-term indicators turn back to green. So the percent of stocks trading above their 50-day moving average or short-term trend had started to improve. The percent of stocks with positive weekly price momentum or, or upward trajectory had started to increase. And the percent of stocks trading above their 150-day moving average, again, had been moving higher. So those are three positives. Um, we also highlighted 
that our long-term trend indicators for percent of stocks in the S&P in uptrends had turned higher. Uh, the bullish percent for not NASDAQ 100 or the big tech stocks had turned higher. And the bullish percent for the S&P mid cap had turned higher. And all of those things were encouraging despite the fact that we still had a lot of news coming at us. We talked about the fact that in the previous few weeks, the yield on a 10 year bond had started to rally which really only happens for two reasons. One, if we think that there's credit risk, and so investors start to demand a higher yield, but we weren't seeing any sign of that in our other indicators. The other reason that uh, yields can go higher is there's an expectation that growth may reaccelerate in the coming months. We saw that copper had started to outperform gold, so more economically sensitive versus defensive. And we saw that regional banks had started to outperform real estate investment trusts again, they tend to be more forward-looking what is going to be happening in the economy because they're more focused on the U.S. economy. We came into last week, the market had been chopping sideways after having corrected. And we said, really, we could go higher, we could go lower. Our sense is that we're more likely to go higher as we reduce the amount of uncertainty. So uh, here we are a week later. Um, we've had an election. Uh, the election is yet to be, of course, confirmed. There's lots of controversy, but it does suggest that the Democrats and specifically Joe Biden uh, has uh, won the presidency. Uh, that clearly is still up for some debate, uh, but there does appear to be enough state by state data that it's unlikely to be unturned, overturned. Uh, it does look like it's very possible that the Senate could be run by the Republicans, which would limit sort of more extreme uh, uh, policy moves. And so those two things, I think, give investors the sense that there is less likely to be extreme volatility in policy. That's a good thing. The second thing on the, on the, on the, on the uh, virus, which we are clearly in the middle of the second wave, this week we had some good news on vaccine from Pfizer. And not only was it shown to be effective, but effective at greater than 90% of the cases. And the CEO, when interviewed on CNBC said, we use 90% as a benchmark, but frankly, the number is much higher. Now we still have to see safety data uh, and we still have to see them get approval, but it is positive, especially given the fact that it's on the mRNA platform, which is effectively gene editing. It's not taking bits of the virus and injecting them into uh, into recipients. It's actually creating the, the potential for the body to create the protein to fight the virus, which is safer. And Moderna is operating on the same platform. And interestingly enough, that technology, that CRISPR technology uh, was uh, won, the, won the Nobel Prize and has, has application far beyond vaccines. It has application in helping to repair uh, genetic deficiencies for all kinds of different ailments. So that is a, an optimistic thing looking forward. So I would say on the virus, some good news. Uh, on the election, I think some relatively positive news, still lots of things to worry about. Trump is not gonna make this easy, but for investors who had braced themselves for you know, potential unrest uh, and potential difficult outcomes, I think things seem to be a little bit better and the market sort of responded. So leading into the election, actually the market rallied for a couple of days, broke out of this range that we had been in. And on election day, opened with a big gap. Now this is the S&P and the S&P 500 encompasses all kinds of different sectors. There is a very significant technology weight, which has been leading. And of course has been one of the areas that investors have hidden in while other parts of the economy were under pressure. Now, what happened in the course of that day was while the market opened much stronger, it weakened pretty significantly through the day for the S&P. And really what caused the weakness was technology. So technology that the, the QQQ or the NASDAQ 100 rallied into the election, election day opened really strong, but finished fairly weak on the day. Now, it doesn't mean that that's a really negative thing. What it means is that investors Took the, took the opportunity to say, we have new information, potentially uh, potentially we could have uh, some good uh, outcomes for the vaccine, uh, potentially other industries might 
be a safer position today. We're going to move some money to some other themes. And for a couple of days, technology sold off. Today, you can see technology found its footing and rallied on the day and actually had, had quite a good day. The Dow Industrials had the biggest move higher along with the Russell 2000, and then it settled in for a couple of days here. So moving forward a week, I would say that the market is resolved higher. Certainly we are not completely out of the woods on things to worry about, still lots of things to worry about, but there's lots of cash sitting on the sidelines. And there were a lot of people short going into the, going into the election. So what other things do we look for to give us some support that risk assets might be in a better spot? So this is a chart of the spread or the extra return a bond investor expects for the risk that they take to buy a corporate bond versus a government bond. So this is for investment grade bonds. You can see that spread spiked in March, April as the biggest fears about the pandemic found their way into the market. And then investors became more and more uh, comfortable with the risk. Now, certainly the Fed has been supporting these, but as of the beginning of this week, we hit a new low in that spread, meaning investors are demanding less premium to buy a corporate obligation than they had really since the beginning of the pandemic. And the same thing for high yield bond investors, which are lower credit, lower credit quality. But again, if we thought that risks were going up in the economy, you would expect to see the spreads widen. And that's not what's happening. So that confirms some of that strength that we've seen in our indicators and seen in the market. Volatility. This was the run up in volatility in the election, people buying protection. And now investors clearly expecting a lot less volatility going forward after two weeks of falling ball. Now we're about as low as we've been going back to August. Again, another sign investors are becoming more comfortable with the outlook going forward. So we remain in a structural bull market. And certainly the markets bounced around a bit over the course of the year, but the S&P clearly in the upward channel as is the NASDAQ 100. Now, you know that what we care about is less about what the indices do because the indices are dominated by the very biggest stocks. We know the top five stocks in the NASDAQ 100 is an inordinate percent of the move in the index and that the bottom 10 or 20 are relatively small. So what we like to know is as time goes by, are the percentage of stocks in uptrends increasing, meaning more and more stocks are participating, which means the market's broadening and becoming more and more healthy. That's constructive. That's when we want to be invested. That's when we want to put on new positions. And we want to find sectors that are going through the same expansion in breadth. Or on the other hand, are we seeing deterioration in breadth where you could see the leading stocks continuing on, but the weakest ones actually rolling over and heading south under the surface? That's a warning sign to us. That gives us reason to be more cautious. That forces us to have a little bit of cash. It forces us to tighten up our stop loss. It stops us from putting on new positions. So here's where we are today. U.S. breadth indicator turned positive over the past week. Global breadth turned positive. Canadian breadth indicator is just turning positive today. All of our short-term indicators have continued to improve over the course of the week. And while some of the leading stocks up to the election took a breath and in fact pulled back companies like Apple and Amazon, we've seen expansion in breadth in new groups that have been signaled over the last little while. So let's just talk our way through this. Semiconductors, which I think are one of the greatest indicators of expectation for economic growth because the basic building block in the new economy, certainly had a sharp pullback on Monday and Tuesday, but clearly in a very strong uptrend. Relative strength has been very, very strong, took a step back for two days today up over 3% at about 3.45 this afternoon, a little stronger, I think, into the close. No change here. Uh, within Also within technology, software. And we talked last week about the fact that more economically sensitive stocks had started to outperform, less economically sensitive stocks, a little bit less. Software pulled back a little bit more. And people buy software because it has recurring revenue and is less economically sensitive, something that pay, people pay a subscription for. So it certainly pulled back, but again, after a couple of days of pullback, found its footing today a little bit higher. 
So let's keep running through the groups. Consumer discretionary, which certainly has been leadership through the course of the year. This is rising relative price strength, backed off a little bit Monday, Tuesday, stronger today. And that a lot of that had to do with Amazon pulling back. But you know, using Costco as an example, a sharp down day on that big rally day. Lots of people phoned in to say, I know the market was up a bunch today and they were referencing the Dow Jones, which we rarely compare ourselves to because it's only 30 stocks. It was up largely industrials. NASDAQ was up, a, sorry, S&P up a little, NASDAQ down a lot because the growth stocks had pulled back. Costco pulled back with, with the market on that day, found its footing, now moving higher up and having a good day today. Clearly no change in trend, the moving averages are moving higher, just a little pullback, nothing to be concerned about. Robotics, well, this is industrials. And so they responded very nicely over the last week. And so robotics and automation and industrials in particular, we've talked about the fact that industrials have really joined this rally, which was important because it is economically sensitive. It's saying that the economy is likely to get better. We talked about companies like Cummins Diesel, which have been marking their way higher, Caterpillar Equipment, uh, Danaher, lots of, lots of different industrial companies. Transports, transports had a good day early in the week and have held their gains. Uh, companies like um, like uh, the railroads and the truckers. We talked last week about the fact that dividend growth had started to really outperform high dividend payers. And that if you think that rates could go higher, you need to have something with a rising stream of income. I referenced Home Depot as an example. Well, this is the last two weeks in the RDVY, which is the dividend growers, ETF. Big gap up on Monday after already having a very good week, very sharp increase in relative price strength. This is very favorable because this is where we're focused in our income strategy in dividend growth. Materials also over the last few weeks has really have started to really outperform and that includes chemical companies, uh, base metals miners, like we talked about Freeport, McMoran, copper and gold. We talked about uh, Rio Tinto, talk about uh, uh, first quantum copper, uh, really good two weeks. Now we came into this period not owning a ton of these things. We had started to ramp up some positions and of course with new strength, it means that we continue. I talked about regional banks and the fact that they had really underperformed and the large banks through the course of the year. Even with the rally in the last two weeks, still down 21% from the highs in February but really encouraging that they had started to outperform in the beginning of September. And as the election took place, and as the vaccine news came, very sharp spike. Now, this is not gonna go straight higher. The long-term moving averages are still sort of flattening out. They'll act as a little bit of a magnet. So these could certainly pull back. But in the last two weeks, we've added some positions. We added some uh, regions financial. And to go back to our strategy, we try to identify the companies within these sectors that have been outperforming prior to the improvement in the group. So Regions Financial has been strengthening really since June and behaving much better than banks as a whole. This is SBB Financial, Silicon Valley Bank Corp based in California. Do a lot of financing of technology companies, often get paid warrants or participation when the companies they finance go public. Again, solidly outperforming through the year, we've increased our weighting here. But we also increased our weight to Bank of America, which is very US centric. So if the concept is that as time goes by, you want more and more stocks participating in a rally, for a market to become more healthy, you wanna have more and more sectors participating in a rally. So the fact that industrials have started to lead, the fact that we're seeing better strength in banks, the fact that we're seeing improvement in small and mid-sized companies over the last two weeks, this is a sign of broadening within the market. The day that Pfizer announced its vaccine, bullish percent for the NYSE went up 12%. So 12% of all the stocks in the NYSE gave new buy signals. That's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. Even if some of the leading stocks pulled back for a couple of days. Now, energy also had a very big week, 
but you can see this has been a really an underperforming group. We came in with very little exposure. We've had some tourmaline for some time, which is really only one of sort of five major gas producers that remain solvent. And they have been a winner uh, and they will continue to be a winner, uh, but we still have relatively low energy weight, but again, healthy to see this group join the rally. So look, if I take all of the major geographic regions around the world and put them on a bell curve, depending on what percent of the companies in that region are in uptrends, we know that at the end of a bull market, most of the areas of the world will have a very high percentage of stocks and uptrends, and then maybe it's over. What I can say is all US is positive, Latin America is positive, Europe is positive, Middle East is positive, Asia Pacific is positive. Some of the Latin American areas like Brazil are quite interesting, South Korea, Germany. Um, we're seeing a broadening of this global stock market rally. When we look at sectors, the sectors in capital letters are showing expanding breadth. And you can see the vast majority are showing expansion of breadth, including oil and oil service, which have only a very small percentage of stocks performing well, but that's improving. Again, that's all very healthy. So what does that mean? We've been talking now over the last few weeks that we've been bumping up our industrials exposure from a low weight now to a pretty good weight. Uh, we have continued to sort of reduce our reliance on technology, not because we don't think technology will do well, but because it's very broadly owned and, and could be used as a source of funds to buy other parts of the market that are joining, joining the rally. That's what happened on Monday and Tuesday. So that people didn't decide on Monday that they didn't like Apple or they didn't like Amazon, but they said, we really want to own some Bank of America. We got to sell some. But there's different sources of buyers. We have people who are market animals, who are in the market fully invested, who decide to have to take from here to give to there. But there's close to $5 trillion sitting in money market funds that can be deployed. There are trillions of dollars hiding in the bond market which is now giving negative returns, which can start getting pulled out of bonds to put into stocks, which do well in a reflationary environment. We can take money from bonds and move it into things that have dividend growth that would offset rising rates. So our movement has been to increase our industrials weight, to increase our materials weight, to increase our healthcare weight, uh, and to um, uh, uh, build on, and if you remember a couple of weeks ago, we were only down a few weeks, ago, we were only down at 5% finance, so increase our finance weight. Now here's an interesting stat. In the last 10 days, energy, financials, industrials, and materials, largely groups that have lagged over the course of the year had very strong returns in excess of 10%. Now that's happened only a few times in the last number of years. It's happened earlier this year. Now here's a chart of the US stock market and in red, each of the times where you had greater than 10% returns over 10 trading days in those four groups. So what do we know? This happens early in a new leg higher in the market. This is market optimism for the future. So, the end of the 1973-74 bear market, which is the second worst bear market in the century. Early in the 1982-83 bull market that of course went on until 2000. And after the financial crisis, March of 2009, spring of 2009. So these are positive things. Now we watch our breadth models every day and I will tell you right now they're improving. Seasonally, we're into the strongest time of the year. We are slowly putting uncertainties behind us. We cannot wait until there's a vaccine been passed around and has stopped this pandemic. Market will be way higher by then. We watch very closely for signs that we should be more cautious. We are not frivolous with risk. When things start to turn down, we've had a history of getting very defended. As it is right now, I am optimistic. And we have lots of targets for new money. Uh, we think this is a great time to be adding money to the portfolios. Because as I say, we're through October 31st. We're through the election. 
Yes, there are still some question marks. And if there were no question marks, the market would be, I think, much higher. But as it sits right now, I think that it's steady as she goes and we'll work our way higher. So with that, Pamela, if you have uh, any questions on the line, I'm certainly happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Dave. With that newfound optimism, would you be confident and comfortable uh, to address Biden's policy that may affect the Keystone pipeline? That comes from one of our clients. Yeah, you know, look, there, there are going to be all kinds of different individual policy issues that arise. The first thing that has to happen is that he has to be confirmed as president. Now, it looks like that is a pretty distinct possibility. Uh, I think that Donald Trump would argue that, uh, but we'll see that resolved over the next month or two. Um, I think that historically, to make your decisions based on who winds up being elected as the decision-making tool has not been very successful. Actually, most times, if you took a basket of companies or sectors that you would expect to do well with a particular elector, elector, elected official, it tends not to play out because there's so many other things that impact markets. Um, I think that there is very low expectation right now in the market for, uh, for pipelines going forward. Uh, and so, um, you know, I think there's a lot of discounted bad news in there now. Uh, if, um, if it's a split, uh, split house, then I think that it's uh, less troublesome than if they had control of the Senate as well. Thank you so much, Dave. If someone was looking to play the China market, what ETF would you recommend? Great question. So I think that China looked really attractive. Uh, it's pulled back a little in the last couple of days. So CHIQ, I think, is very, very attractive. And I think that that's one that you might want to take a look at. Uh, that is the Chinese uh, consumer ETF. I think that you could also look at KWeb, which is a Chinese uh, internet and technology companies. It's pulled back over the last week. And uh, in simplest terms, I would take a look at ASHR, which is the, uh, CS, the uh, CSI 300. Again, looks very, very attractive. Breaking out of a range that's been in really since 2015. Uh, also, the Japanese market looks really good. It just made a new 31-year uh, uh, high. So it's been in a bear market for 31 years. EWJ is a way that you can invest there. And we talked, I think, last week a little bit about the Taiwanese market. Uh, and you can invest EWT, which we, we also own uh, there. And I think that that's very attractive. And, um, and that, that's dominated by Taiwan Semi. And, uh, and that's one just to take a look at. See if I can pull these up. Okay, here we go. So EWT is uh, the Taiwan market. Let's pull it back to a five year. Let's pull it back to something even greater. Uh, if you were to the CHIQ, you can see you want to, when you invest in an area, you want to find what has been leading before the entire market became attractive. And this is the CHIQ ETF, which has been leading really since March. It's been about the strongest ETF on the board. Uh, KWeb, which pulled back uh, over the past week, just into this sort of consolidation range is very attractive. And we know that there's been some politics around Jack Ma and Alibaba. Uh, and just the ASHR is the Chinese uh, CSI 300. Thanks so much, Dave. I have a couple more questions for you. Um, we will get to the gold question after, but um, there is some curiosity about how to play oil and gas. And that's- yeah. So I'm gonna be very cautious with this. Um, you know, now remember that the oil and gas sector is now 3% of the S&P. So it's a used to be 35% of the market. So it has become a relatively small sector. It faces headwinds from ESG investors or, or um, uh, uh, um, ecologically and socially uh, responsible investors. Um, it is challenged certainly by COVID. 
and, and challenged, as we've talked about since 2014, by the fact that technology is out there to find gas in 99% of the holes you drill or oil because of fracking. Um, but lots of companies have been weakened. And so you want to always focus on the strength. We do have exposure to Canadian natural resources. And it's because there's 100 years of reserve life. Uh, it's uh, oil that is uh, attractive to refineries and uh, it's very well financed and they will cash flow a lot going forward. So that's one way. We also own tourmaline, uh, which is more gassy. So um, those, those would be two ways. Y you can buy the ETF XOP. The problem is that you're buying all the worst companies along with the best and in, in oil and gas. You want to be careful about that. Okay, well, and any, any, Dave, any comments on gold? Yeah, sure. Um, so look, we've had a recent little rally in the U.S. dollar, and that's put a little bit of pressure on things that benefit from a weak dollar. I think that there's a very clear downward trend in the U.S. dollar, and I would expect that, as I said last week, that it will continue lower. There was a big bond, bond auction in the U.S. this week that caused international investors to want to buy U.S. dollars to buy, buy these bonds. Um, but uh, I've shown this, I think, before. Uh, but this is, for instance, this is the chart of silver. And this is the 30-year consolidation. For, so you expect uh, when something is getting close to breaking out for it to pull back into support before it continues on. So this is actually a textbook price pattern that you would expect in any asset that's, that's been out of favor for a long time that that is getting ready to have a significant rally. And the fact that it pulls back over the course of two or three weeks is really not a big deal. So at this point, we think both uh, silver looks really attractive, companies like Pan American Silver uh, or SIL, which is the silver ETF, uh, or in the golds, either GDX, which is the ETF, or uh, some, of the, uh, some of the senior producers, uh, Newmont Mining, I think looks really attractive. So you can see it's consolidated here over the last couple of months, broke out and it's pulled back in the last week while the US dollar was rallying. I think it's an excellent entry point. Uh, you could also pull up a uh, Barrick Gold and it looks quite similar. Hold on, ABX in the US, uh, sorry, GOB. Uh, looks quite good. Agnico Eagle looks quite good. Uh, again, pulling back into this moving average, good entry point. Pan American Silver, I think looks quite similar. Uh, and that fits well with the whole copper uh, uh, copper stocks, which again, also are, look quite attractive. So basic materials in general, I think look good. If you think that governments are gonna continue to need to print money, and, and, and run stimulus programs, which I think we're gonna see, it's, it's likely that they do well and, and probably Bitcoin as well and other digital currencies. And Dave, the last question for this afternoon comes from the beautiful West Coast, Canada's beautiful West Coast. This client knows exactly who, uh, who I'm talking about. And his question is, if you could comment on two logistics companies, Canaxis and Descartes, um, they've recently pulled back. Do you think this is temporary or a change in direction? Okay, so I wanna be clear. So many of the technology stocks that have won through COVID have gone through a transformation that they will not pull away from. Companies that have hired and purchased Descartes uh, logistics platform or Canaxis's technology platform are not going to move away with it, may move away from it when COVID is solved. Now, certainly in the last week, the places that people had hid during COVID have seen some selling, as I said, to buy some other groups. But I would expect that would find a footing in and around these levels very soon. So I do not think that one or two pieces of news changes a long-term structural theme. You know, if we look at uh, digital um, uh, e-commerce, a terrible two days on Monday and Tuesday finds its footing and moves a little higher. You know, so that would be an example of Amazon. All kinds of companies. Now, there are some companies that are more promise than steak and potatoes. 
they may in fact be out of favor from some time, but Canaxis and uh, Descartes are not that. Thank you so much, Dave. That concludes all of the questions that we have for today's webcast. And uh, of course, we look forward to hosting next Wednesday and having everyone join us again. Dave, do you have any final remarks before we yeah, sign up? If, if anybody has a question uh, that they'd like answered in between calls, or they have uh, things that they'd like to discuss, please do not hesitate to call us. We may not be in the office, but we are by our phones and, uh, and the team is working well together. I'll do my best to answer. If it's not me, one of our analysts can certainly jump on the phone uh, and answer your questions. We appreciate the fact that it is an unusual time and we don't get to see people in person, which we're used to doing, uh, but certainly we can jump on a Zoom call or, or take a phone call and, uh, and answer it. And you know, um, I think the most important thing to take away from what we've been going through is that the market does not wait for an all clear sign. Uh, it moves and fits and starts as things seemingly are improving. There will always be people to tell us that they're not. But if breadth is improving and there is clear leadership in the market, you want to be there and you want to be invested. And I think that right now we're in one of those situations. So uh, I think uh, we, we, we have a good number of months in front of us, uh, probably a couple of years. And if you've got questions and want to talk further about that, don't hesitate to give us a call. Thanks so much, Dave. And thanks everyone for joining us. We'll see you next Wednesday.